Comedy Rapport with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Thursday, December 15th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Eric Alterman, professor of English and journalism at Brooklyn College, writer of the Altercation Newsletter at the American Prospect and author of We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel. He'll be speaking to Sam from the past. And later in the program, Javier Puente, professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at Smith College will be joining us live from Peru to talk about the ousting of Pedro Castillo. Meanwhile, the Fed has officially announced yet another benchmark interest rate raise, the highest it has been in 15 years. Unemployment is stage two increase next year, Jay Powell announced proudly. The House has approved the short-term government spending bill as they finalize the details of the long-term package. The deadline is next Friday. The House also passed a police de-escalation training bill along bipartisan lines. It's kind of the opposite, but... That comes with more funding for cops to do this kind of training. The DOJ is suing outgoing Republican Governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey, for his illegal stunt stacking shipping containers along the U.S.-Mexico border. I sometimes hear conservatives complain about how um, wind wind turbines look, make the environment look. (laughs) Yeah, rusty shipping containers are much prettier. A wall of them, in fact. Symbolism's there, too. Mm. Garbage. U.S. deaths have fallen this year from 2020 and 2021 levels, but still not down to before the pandemic. This comes as the Biden administration has renewed their free COVID test by mail program. Four tests per person available now via USPS Get Them. I just ordered mine this morning. Elon Musk has unloaded 22 million shares of Tesla stock, cashing out with $3.6 billion as the company's shares have been plummeting ever since his acquisition of Twitter. The largest higher education strike in U.S. history is entering its second month. Two of the three unions representing University of California academic workers remain on strike, while the third signed a contract sparking frustration with some rank-and-file members. A new report from the Human Rights Campaign has found that hospitals and providers in 21 different states that are providing gender-affirming care have seen increased harassment and threats in the recent months. And lastly, Peru has declared a state of emergency as protests continue to rage in the country after Castillo was ousted. And we'll be talking more about that with our guests in the second part of the first hour of this program. (laughs) All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. Got a great show for you. Sam pre-recorded this excellent interview with uh, Eric Alterman. So that will be uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes, you'll be hearing that. And then I'll be speaking uh, with Javier Puente, which I'm very excited about. Um, let's just start off with this. So there was a hearing yesterday addressing violence against, against uh, LGBTQ plus people. 
And um, Brandon Wolf spoke at this hearing. Brandon Wolf is uh, the press secretary for an organization called Equality Florida, an anti hate organization. Um, must be difficult to have to le uh, be a part of an anti hate organization in this environment with that governor, mm -hmm. with attacks on uh, similar organizations. I think it was in Tallahassee when they threw, or, or uh, the brick through that window. Um, very difficult and admirable work. Um, here he is addressing the House Oversight Committee. And by the way, I should say, Brandon survived the Pulse nightclub shooting. Um, and here he is speaking about the attacks on gay, trans, queer people by people like uh, Re uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, who is the governor of his state. For years, cynical politicians and greedy grifters have joined forces with right-wing extremists to pour gasoline on anti-LGBTQ hysteria and terrorize our community. My own governor, Ron DeSantis, has trafficked in that bigotry to feed his insatiable political ambition and propel himself toward the White House. We have been smeared and defamed. Hundreds of bills have been filed in order to erase us. Powerful figures have insisted that the greatest threats this country face are a teacher with they, them pronouns or someone in a wig reading Redfish, Bluefish. And all along, we warned that these short-sighted political maneuvers would come with a human cost, but they've continued anyway. Even as queer kids told us that they were scared, that life was getting less safe for them, even as hate violence has escalated, as children's hospitals have faced mounting bomb threats, as armed protesters started showing up at pride festivals and brunches, as a donut shop in Oklahoma was firebombed for daring to host a drag show, even as five innocent people in Colorado Springs went into a space that was supposed to be safe for them and came out in body bags, the attacks have continued. We can be better than that. We have to be better than that. Right-wing extremism relies on this manufactured belief that its poison is inevitable, that resistance is hopeless, but I contend that taking a stand is necessary, that it is our duty. We need to say without apology that people who endanger entire marginalized communities for social media content and fundraising fodder have no place in our politics. We need to hold accountable those who traffic in venomous bigotry to score cheap political points. We need to address how our obsession with easy access to guns takes dangerous hatred and makes it fatal. And we need to say unequivocally right here, right now, that LGBTQ lives matter, that trans lives matter, and that in this country that is not up for debate. You can tell why he's the press secretary, right? Like he knows how the public speak. Yeah, so. and, and he knew. And he also, I think what's great too about this clip is he also he's he's he summarizes very um, succinctly and and uh, concisely who these who he's like kind of calling out besides Ron DeSantis and not by name is like people like like libs of TikTok and Chris Rufo. Yeah, and and understanding that they are the pipeline that leads to these attacks happening. Yes. Um <laughs> and and, it, and it's important I think for this to be said like in the halls of Congress that this is a, this is not just an online oh it's only in the Twitter echo chambers. This stuff does actually yes. lead to violence. I mean, I just headlined it that uh dozens of hospitals and healthcare providers are facing increased threats and um uh just terror really uh from uh in uh, many states in this country right now at this point um and it's because there are groups like libs of tiktok that are publicizing information and targeting providers and anybody essentially who affirms uh trans people and provides gender affirming uh care for them i saw that elon musk this morning was tweeting about how he's going to take down any accounts that docks the whereabouts uh, of of people in real time um, and docks people because he, that was his justification for taking down the account that tracked his private jet, um, which he said he wouldn't do a month earlier. And people were responding, well, OK, libs of TikTok is going to go. No, it's not, because um, that kind of hate account 
it, now that this billionaire owns this major social media company that he agrees with it ideologically so it'll stay up it's american is apple pie um a, a, a country that had 100 years ago a problem with lynchings to the point where congress wouldn't act on it because uh basically i mean i say this like libs of tiktok um 100 years ago would be like n-word lovers of tiktok that's where that person would be at mm. i mean yeah um what's this here Bradley's pulling something. So someone, up. someone just note when they were talking about how Elon Musk had basically changed the rules to, um, um, basically specifically uh, prohibit people from, like the Elon Musk flight tracker from releasing yeah. information. They also then released a new rule that essentially just explicitly outlines, kind of a carve out for what people, what like accounts like libs of TikTok do. Can you put it up yeah. on, on the screen here? Uh, you may not share private media such as images or videos of private individuals without their consent. Uh, however, we recognize that there are instances where users may share images or videos of private individuals who are not public figures as part of a newsworthy event or to further public discourse on issues or events of public interest. In such cases, we may allow the media to remain on the platform. I, I, mm, I guess libs of TikTok will be doing a lot of furtherance of public discourse. You know what the public discourse was uh, that was also uh, relevant would be the uh, the fact that this billionaire is flying all over the place, taking 12 minute flights from one side of San Francisco to the other and now owns a major communications platform. Um, not to make this all about Elon Musk, but the let's Who posted put a video of somebody he alleges was like stalking him last night. Um, yeah. In a way that that was a private individual, and I don't know how that's really a public interest. Yeah, did that further the public there's, discourse? Except there's any interest there. Like, <laughs> if that guy's genuinely stalking you, uh, talk to the authorities. Yeah. Um, don't oh, break God. your rules <laughs> that you just imposed on the platform to um, carve out for libs. Of he has no plan beyond tomorrow, um, this guy. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's well said, and it's necessary because there's going to be a lot of justifiable uh, happiness uh, completely understandable uh, about the the signing of the Re Respect for Marriage Act, which enshrines protections for same sex couples and interracial couples um, in this country. Th there will be hap uh, happiness about that, and there should be. But the point is, is that we are so far, so far from this fight being over. Um, we are in the middle of a resurgence of hate against gay and trans people in this country and it's affecting lives it's being enshrined into legislation ron DeSantis, um as uh, as brandon was discussing there is at the forefront of it with the don't say gay bills and uh now people are having to flee different states in this country in order to just ensure that their children are able to access care and that they're able to live in peace when their ch children are accessing care i'd encourage everybody to look up this vice news report where they followed three families in Texas who are having to flee and choosing to do so, and just what you see um, in their desperation to just make sure that their child is safe and happy and what that's doing to them and how they fear for their neighbors, that they're going to be reported to the authorities because they provide uh, gender-affirming care for their children. Um, that w We are... Th the Respect for Marriage Act might have been one great step forward, but we're taking many steps back on a daily basis right now with uh lgbtq hate oh yeah and it's the same thing with like knowing that that vice piece speaks to how this stuff has actual these like sam says you guys that you and sam say this all the time but like this stuff like when roe was overturned it's not this is not theoretical this is not academic these like as much as they don't as much as republicans and, and and conservative media and members of congress don't want it to have actual material repercussions it's that's at their feet it doesn't matter whether they're saying oh well that's not what we intended i don't care what you intended <laughs> someone has to someone has to deliver an ectopic pregnancy yep someone has to deliver a a malformed fetus because of a and it is what they intend and and, and and right regardless you can window dress and say the left made me do it. I don't. That's not true. You made yourself do it. Yep. And it's the same thing here. The the Colorado Springs shooting, the the gender affirming care centers being under attack. All of this is manifest because of of their rhetoric and their actions. And if you even think that something as anodyne as or seemingly anodyne as as, as a same sex marriage bill being codified at the federal level, um, after what we saw about Brandon's comments, let's just see what Laura Ingram had to say about all that. Here we go. 
House. Now, as we just mentioned with Governor DeSantis, Joe Biden held kind of an over the top uh, you know, celebration, this extravaganza. Stop rubbing our face in it. Named the Respect for Marriage Act, a bill that moves to restrict freedom of religion and freedom of speech even. Meaning whether you're Catholic or evangelical or maybe Muslim, any serious person of faith, you will not necessarily have the rights tomorrow that you had yesterday. But like Pelosi made famous, Biden tried to frame this as protecting the children. Yeah, I, I don't understand how anybody has woken up this morning with less rights. Um, their rights have been expanded, and but I mean, like they, they have to present rights as a zero sum. Even if I believed that, I'd be like, "Can you slow down? How what what happened to me? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my right. Are... Oh, oh, uh, right. My marriage has been diminished. That's, I mean, that's so half hearted too. Like I, I, I know we're in the middle of uh, yes, as we say. Uh, resurgence of hate but like even laura ingram there i don't know how much she believes that really over the top ceremony because sam smith that and was, cindy well, lopper yeah, the, the their messaging oh. their messaging has to speak to two audiences one is the like horrible bigots who really resent that gay marriage was legalized in this country and the other is the naive dumbasses who think that the gop has actually turned the corner on the issue mm -hmm. so when they act like oh rub our faces and all this sort of meta critique on it they can speak to both those people at the same time without actually like uh showing which uh, side they come down on mm -hmm. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break. When we come back, uh, Sam Cedar pre-recorded interview with Eric Alterman. And then after that is over, uh, we will be um, speaking with, uh, with ha here we go, Javier Puente, a professor of Latin American and Latino studies at Smith College. And we'll be uh, getting an update uh, from him from Peru. <laughs> We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a real pleasure to welcome back to this program Eric Alterman. He's a professor of English and journalism at Brooklyn College, writer of the Altercation newsletter at the American Prospect, uh, author of his latest of, I think he's now written maybe a dozen books. Um, uh, we are not one, a history of America's fight over Israel. Eric, always a pleasure. To have you back on the program, you may be one of. I it is very possible that there has you have been uh, on this program as many times as 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 just about anybody. But I think uh, I, you know Janine and I interview you more than likely at the earliest on this program. You may have like the longest record on this program. You know, and I feel like I'm never invited. I feel like I turn it on and go, why is that guy on and not me? What is? What did I do to hurt <laughs> Sam's feelings? Well, uh, as you, I mean, that's just a reflection on 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 what's happening inside of you. But I took over show. for you for a week. On the oh, on the, that's right. You did with Janine. Yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. yeah. So so that I, I missed out on being with you. I had to deal with, I mean, I, I love Janine, but she has some strange ideas. Well, <laughs> be it as it may, let's talk about um, uh, We Are Not One. It is, um, it's it's particularly fascinating to me because, you know, um, m m what you outline in the book in sort of like a, a broader sense is it was in many ways a trajectory that I went uh, through personally uh, and experienced, you know, because you're writing about uh, the American debate uh the israel fr uh, in the, uh i guess on the the perspective of like what has been the american debate right well the subtitle it. is a history of america's fight over israel so that's what the book is about and it's not uh, about israel or about the american or about american israel relations it's about the american debate over Israel. so let's go to like pre world war ii pre israel israel founded in, in 1948 uh the zionists um the Zionists were were meeting for you know sixty years, fifty years before uh, Israel was founded. What was like? Was there an, an American, I guess, perspective on Zionism? And if so, who held it, and in what circles was it argued? Well, uh, people are usually surprised to hear that American Jews were really strongly anti-Zionist. Um, from the time that Zionism, the modern Zionist movement was founded 
1896 or 1897. Uh, the, the phrase, America is our Zion, was always the response from American Jews who were, uh, there, there were, I mean, there were a lot of Jews here beginning in the 1880s, but the Eastern European Jews who started coming then, and ultimately about 2 million of them eventually showed up, generally deferred to the German Jews who had gotten here in uh, the 1840s and 1850s. And the German Jews were really nervous about being thought of as not good citizens, as less than patriotic Americans, as somehow the fact that they were not Christian made them suspect, which was partially true, but actually less true in the United States than anywhere else. So they didn't want anything that smacked of, of the ghetto uh, that, uh, that Jews had traditionally lived in. So um, the other thing that was important to the Germans was that they insisted that Judaism was a religion and not an ethnic identity. So whereas they may have felt sorry for the Eastern European Jews who were getting their asses kicked over in Europe, they weren't the same people. It wasn't they really their problem. Um, and, and again, they were the thing that was most important to them was proving that they were good American citizens. And they thought that the idea of a Jewish homeland would call all, all that into question and would inspire the kind of anti-Semitism that had been the case everywhere else in the world up until that moment. So um, this only began to change, it began to change uh, considerably in the 1920s when Louis Brandeis, who was a German Jew on the Supreme Court, but also a hero to Eastern European Jews for his fights for Jewish labor unions, um, took over the Zionist Organization of America and uh, transformed it into saying, well, it's not for American Jews. We don't need a Zion, but other people do. So uh, from now on, our Zionist movement is about helping Jews get to Palestine, but not us. So everybody said, well, that makes sense. That's fine. That's patriotic. And um, But it was still kind of a struggle between the old view and the new view. That struggle ended with the discovery of the Holocaust. When let me let me just interrupt you for one moment, just sure. to, to sort of like just fill in, you know, when when you say the Eastern European uh, uh, Jews were suffering uh, as opposed to the Germans, we're talking about essentially um, uh, Jews in uh, who were in Russia and maybe subject to pogroms. And, and it, it was called the Pale of Settlement. You know, Warsaw was one third Jewish. I mean, Poland, Russia. Uh, Ukraine had enormous Jewish populations at the time. And uh, and life became untenable for them leading up to the revolution, the Russian revolution, um, because the czars used, found them to be very, and the other leaders found them to be very useful scapegoats. And, uh, and they were deeply involved in the revolutionary movements. Jews were, uh, Leon Trotsky was Jewish and, and, and uh, it, that was not unusual. So uh, actually, the German Jews for a long time, despite the pogroms, were against Jewish immigration to the United States. They did not want the Eastern European Jews coming over and messing up everything they had set up. But they, had, they were all reformed Jews. They were pretty wealthy. They were doing well in business. They were having their own law firms and their own doctors, you know, their own banks, um, country clubs. But then uh, there was one famous pogrom called the Kishinev pogrom, which actually is kind of a media story because it wasn't that big a pogrom, but it was very heavily covered by the media. And then after that pogrom, they said, okay, we'll bring them over and we'll civilize them. So it's a very interesting story. It's a little, it's a little off the topic. Right. Um, but uh, by that time, the, uh, at, at some point, the Eastern European Jews were going to overtake the German Jews because there were 10 times as many of them. And they were much more sympathetic to Zionism because it was their family members who hadn't gotten into, after 1924, no, no, nobody was allowed to come into the country from there. So the only place they could go to be for safe was to Palestine, if they could get into Palestine. And that's how uh, Brandeis's uh, sort of like new vision for Zionism, like Zionism, yeah. I think- The two your, were consistent with one another. I think you actually say uh, Zionism for thee, but not for me, is actually yep. the your opening uh, title of your chapter. Um, and, and and I could talk about Brandeis's perspective on there for for, for a while, but let's move forward um, into so the, the Zionism is there. American Jewry um, sees it as something as maybe like a you know 
an answer to the 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 dilemma or the um, uh, uh, persecution that European Eastern European Jews are going through. Yeah. And then this all changes uh, with the Holocaust, where there's, this, I guess, a universal understanding of Jews that maybe we're just not as safe. What was it that uh, that that opened up the, the idea of? Well, that again, you know, the reason this book is 500 pages is because everything is complicated. And it's also you didn't ask me, but it's a big reason I wrote the book, because you can't really talk about anything having to do with Jews in Israel or just plain Israel and Palestine. Uh, without going into all these various complications. So the American Jewish response to the Holocaust and to Zionism is still a matter of real deep contention among historians and among many Jews, because there's an accusation in the air and was made at the time, and it's still made sometimes, that American Jews let the Eastern European Jews get slaughtered in order to support the Zionists, and that this was the official policy of the Zionists. And you can find quotes that certainly imply that. Um, it's complicated because there wasn't really much American Jews could do to save the Jews of Europe, but they could do something to help the Zionists. And the Zionists were thrilling. It was going to be the first Jewish homeland in 2000 years. And they were making the desert bloom and they were fighters and they were creating this new Jew. Whereas the Jews who were getting slaughtered in Eastern Europe were the old Jews who were helpless and unable to defend themselves. And, and, um, and, and it just was depressing as all hell and 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 shameful in some ways uh it perceived as such so the zionists had a pretty good uh deal to offer even though it, it looks awfully machiavellian in retrospect saying don't worry about them we're going to save future Jews because we're not safe ever anywhere we need a homeland it's the only way we'll ever be safe. So if we can't save these Jews, we're going to save the Jews that haven't been born yet. That's that's the way they put it. And this argument was compelling for a variety of reasons. And the uh, the lobbying campaign among American Jews uh, for uh, the Zionists in the nineteen you know after World War II, it's the greatest lobbying campaign in all history. I think there were there were more postcards sent and letters sent from uh, various towns in America, towns that had hardly any Jews in them. Uh, then there were people in those towns. Um, and there was, you know, the money raised was four times the amount that any money that money had ever been raised before for such a cause. And and it it I think it tipped the balance with uh President Truman in deciding to uh support Israel in the UN, the creation, and then to recognize Israel eleven minutes after the state was declared on May 14th, nineteen forty eight. Or is it May twelfth? I forget. Okay. Well, how 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 what we now refer to as Israel specific was Zionism at that time. Like what, like what it was Zionism prior, like at what point was Zionism a, about Israel? Uh, what we would now call Israel. Um, yeah, I get your question. I get your question. I think I can answer it. There were two kinds of Zionism, neither one of which actually called for statehood. Um, there was one form called cultural Zionism, uh, led by a scholar named Achara Am, that was his Hebrew name. Uh, Peter Beinhart now calls himself a cultural Zionist. And that had that that had nothing to do with creating a state. That had that had to do with creating a new Jewish culture that would radiate from Palestine, but not necessarily rule over anyone. It would be kind of voluntary and it would be a source of inspiration to Jews all over the world. And that happened. Cultural Zionism took place within the context of political Zionism. And again, political Zionism didn't talk about statehood for a long time. It's an interesting movement. For a while, Theodore Herzl thought it would be just fine to have it in, in Africa, in Kenya, uh, when that seemed like it, it might be on offer. But it, it became clear that the only place that you could get support for it would have been in Palestine, which unfortunately had a lot of people in it. The Zionist slogan uh a people for a land for a land without people was complete nonsense. There, there were a lot of people there. Um, and and there were various forms of Zionism. And again, we could spend our entire time on that. But uh, w the part that I find most compelling and most interesting today to talk about is the fact that there was a strain of Zionism um, led by very important and in, in, uh, influential Jews that said there should be no Israel until the Arabs agree. 
to have one. We, we're only we're not interested in a war. We're not interested in forcing anyone. We only want to live in peace. And if we can't live in peace, we'll wait until we can. Well, that that strain uh, died out pretty quickly, except in the eyes of the New York Times and the United States State, State Department, which stuck with it for a very long time. But uh, there was never any, and there still there really has never been any response from the Arab side later uh, later what we call the Palestinian side to to embrace this idea. So the, famously, the Israeli uh, silver-tongued, everybody says, silver-tongued UN representative um, Alba Eben said the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And that began in the 1920s when they were offered by the British uh, what would have been a majority on a council that would have ruled Palestine, that they could have run things, uh, but they refused to engage. They refused to engage in 1947 when the UN was deciding what to do as the British were leaving, and they refused to get engaged for a long time afterward. Now, there was a problem that required a solution, even if you don't care about Zionism at all, which was there were about a quarter of a million Jews stuck in what were still really concentration camps in Europe at the end of the war, and they needed somewhere to go. They couldn't stay where they were. No country would take them. So you needed a place to take them. And because the Palestinian Arabs at the time refused to engage and the British were keeping them out, that's why you had to have statehood and you had to have a war in order to create this homeland for these refugees. And that's ultimately why the United States, why Harry Truman, I think, ended up supporting it, because he really cared about those those suffering people in those post-war refugee camps. Yeah. Have we do we have a, an analogy to that? I mean, um, to a uh, a quarter million refugees having no place to go. Um, I mean, do, is there any other analogy to that? I mean, are, how, you, are you thinking maybe of the Palestinians today? Well, I mean, on some level, that is the case, right? I mean, we we do have that situation, but. I mean, prior to that, I guess, or or, or since that time. I don't, I don't, I don't have one in mind. I don't have one in mind. But you know, I don't like the whole use of the word Zionism at all uh, in today's arguments about Zion, Zionist versus anti-Zionist because I think it's a settled question. I think Israel is is there. It's not going anywhere. It's like being pro-France or anti-France. You know, it's 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 an entirely academic question. Um, and and when people say. I wish there weren't an Israel, or maybe it wasn't such a good idea to form the state of Israel since there's been war and dislocation and the Nakba, et cetera. Um, you know, again, I can entertain that idea, but I, I still say, what were you going to do about these quarter of a million refugees stuck in refugee camps in Europe that had no place to go, who had just gone through the Holocaust? And if you don't, and, and my answer is you needed a state of Israel. And so I'm for the creation of the state of Israel for that reason. That's a good enough reason for me. And um, and and maybe there would have I definitely can envision better solutions for the Palestinians uh, and for the peace of the region and maybe the peace of the world, uh, but they were not available at the time. I mean, it's, it's very strange to me that the State Department and the Defense Department and the CIA were so strongly against uh, the creation of the State of Israel when they had no alternative. Uh, the, the British were definitely leaving. There were, were no there, American. Tr- were there multiple um, ideas as to how to construct it at that time? The state. Yes. I mean, there's the state of Israel, uh, you know, and then there's the I mean, because and, and like you say, there was a movement within the context of Zionism to say, like, this must we need to do this in conjunction with rather than in. um uh, or rather than not, with uh, the Arab and Palestinian communities that were living. You mean by force? Was there an argument to say we need to do this in a way other than by force? It, uh, and, yeah. And the answer is, after a while, no. In the beginning, yes, people went there with uh, high ideals about it, but they they discovered it was impossible. Uh, David Ben-Gurion wrote a letter to his son in 1937 saying we're going to have to kick him out. You know, we can't create what we need to create as long as they're here. He was for transfer in in 1937. And he had come to Palestine from the Pale of Settlement with very peaceful intention. So, um, you know, once what the, the, there were these massacres, 
that took place by of, of Jews by Arabs uh, in the period of where Zionism was building itself up. And eventually the people who said, we have to do it peacefully, were ultimately discredited, except again, by the New York Times and the, and the State Department. All right. Well, so that that I mean, and I I I, I think in terms of like um, assessing this, you know, the 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 reality is the reality, you know, it, it is as it is at this point. Um, but going. All right. So going forward, uh, at what point? So at that point, American Jewry begins to embrace Zionism in the context of of uh, of something you know greater than maybe just for Eastern Europeans. I mean, just broadly speaking, support for Israel among American Jewry grows uh, so much so that they convince Truman that this is a a political a, a significant enough political movement that um, he could value it, and it's he, he makes his sort of like a return on investment, uh, I guess, calculation. Yeah, well, this was this was how it was viewed by its opponents and certainly by the British, that he, Truman was more concerned about the Jews of New York than he was about the Jews in Europe or Palestine. But I mean, let's be reasonable. Truman was a politician. The Jews were concentrated in metropolitan areas that are Democratic strongholds. He needed those to win. The Democrats needed those to win in 1946 and again in 1948. So the political argument was all on one side. Uh, the 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 people who were worried about the Arabs were basically oil companies and State Department who were worried about and who were worried about communists. There's actually the Republicans were worried that there a lot of these Jews would be communists and that the Russians would be slipping in spies, and and that's why conservatives were much less sympathetic to Israel than um, liberals were. Liberals loved Israel at the time. The nation was so down with Israel. Um, and that was because they were perceived as anti-imperialist, as socialist, and um, and and Russia was supporting it too. So um, interestingly, uh, Israel was a very liberal cause, left of liberal, and the conservatives were much more sympathetic to the Arabs and the British because they kind of liked imperialism and they liked the oil revenue. How let me and and I think like you know I understand the uh, the sense and they didn't like Jews by the way. Conservatives didn't like Jews. There was there was um, a lot of socialists who were who who, uh, you know, were involved in the founding of Israel. And 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 to a certain extent, like it, it, it felt like maybe Israel could have been a a, a socialist country. Uh, it was a socialist I mean, country for quite a while, even, even more so. And I, I want to talk about that. But from an imperialistic perspective, like how how was that uh, perspective maintained? when there was a at least a like a a colonial aspect to this i mean there were jews living there but there were also a lot of palestinian arabs living there uh who had a you know maybe not like a full on national government but there was you know local governments and there was a culture um how did how how was that finessed well, it's a question of definitions. I don't, I don't find the settler colonialist paradigm useful for the creation of the state of Israel because of the Holocaust and because of these two hundred fifty thousand refugees who needed a place to go. The better, you know, Edward Said called the Palestinians the victim of the victim, the victims, and uh, Amos Oz talked about a man falling out of a window and landing on someone else yeah. who then got crushed. So there's no question that the Palestinian Arabs, there was a Nakba, uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe as many as 700,000 were uh, thrown out uh, by force. Um, but uh, again, the the at the time, the British were seen as the imperialists. Britain was an imperial empire. And and they really cared about the oil. The oil people were the bad guys also, and and the Israelis were this new socialist man who were gonna and woman who you know they they uh, they plowed the fields in the morning. They argued over Dostoevsky and Hegel in the afternoon. They they uh, made love right before dinner, and then they went out and fought a war in the evening. 
and did the whole thing the next day. It was it was thrilling for after the Holocaust to see this this new creation. Um, and like I said, liberals were almost 100 percent united behind them. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, it's just funny. I don't know how important it is, but I was having drinks in a wine bar with my then boss, Katrina Vandenhul, uh, on the Upper West Side. And I guess I was talking a little loudly. And the woman next to me says, uh, are you Eric Alterman? And I say, well, yes. And she said, I was your real estate agent 15 years ago or something like that. And uh, I bought this apartment in, that I'm in right now in, in 2003 with the money from What Liberal Media. Um, and, uh, and she said, I heard you talking about Israel and the founding of the state. And, you know, my aunt was the nation, head of the nation's head of the nation foundation and institute back then. And I have her papers and I think you might be interested in looking at them. Can I give them to you? So she gave them to me. Uh, and I, her name was Lily Schultz, the woman who was uh, head of the woman we're talking about. And Lily Schultz as head of the nation foundation was funneling illegal contributions from rich people to the Israeli government uh, to hide them from the tax authorities so that rich American Jews could support Israel without breaking the law or having to pay taxes on it. So the nation was that deeply into supporting Israel. Wow. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, and then um, let's talk about how, what happened to American Jewry in terms of the, its perception of itself. Again, you know, people should keep in mind, we're talking about sort of like where support comes from Israel and the debate that is developed there. Because, I went to, you know, I must have gone, started going to Hebrew school in, uh, in 1971, 1972. And my experience of Hebrew school, which I attended two to three times a week for, you know, uh, for uh, probably about 10 years, somewhere in there, um, was that there were basically three elements of it. One was, um, you know, Hebrew, you would learn Hebrew and, and, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, about the holidays and then was the Holocaust and then was Israel. Like, yeah. and, and, and probably the first part was, you know, was not as accessible. Like we would watch horrible Holocaust movies at a very young, inappropriate. I bet you age. watched Exodus though. Uh, we did not watch that movie. Really? And you talk oh. about this. But yeah. we didn't know. We watched like, I mean, uh, like documentaries and yeah. we saw stuff that kids that age should not see. The sorrow and the pity. Sorrow and the pity. And um, and it was and then Israel was the answer to that. Yes. Yeah. I spent a lot of time on this issue, the quote unquote Zionization of American Jewry. But listen, there's an important part that we got to we got to get to that because that wouldn't have been the case if you were a bit older. So after the state was founded, America just kind of forgot about Israel. They, not entirely. They would maybe march in a parade. Their synagogue, you might have raised money on, uh, you might have had a box on Halloween uh, to raise money to plant trees. But American Jews were concerned with their own problems, their own lives. They, they, were, they were very supportive of civil rights. They were basically just professional liberals. The idea of American Jewry in those days was just we were going to make America a nicer place and the Jews were going to lead that. Um, and so they were for separation of church and state. They were for civil rights. They were for social services. They were basically involved in tikkun olam. Um, and then 1967 happened. And we should and just changed. say tikkun olam is a... Uh, uh, just uh, give us a... It, 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 it translates roughly into the repair the world. So it's it's universalism rather than particularism in terms of what kind of Jew you are. Um, now, all that changed 180 degrees virtually overnight. When I say virtually overnight, what I mean is over six nights um, in 1967, when uh, it, Syria and Egypt combined to form one military nation, mi militarily led nation by Abdul Al General Nasser, who is quoted everywhere saying we're going to drive the Jews into the sea, although he probably never said that. But a lot of things were said that sounded almost as bad. They were joined by Jordan because the king 
even though the king didn't want to join them, and he actually tried to warn the Israelis, uh, he knew he'd be overthrown if he didn't join them. And and uh, you had this you you had this terrible fear among American Jews that there was going to be another Holocaust, and they couldn't do anything about it, and they were really on edge and upset, and and it, it, it felt horrible because again there was still this intense shame and and uh, sorrow over the Holocaust. Um, so bad, so much so that people really couldn't even talk about it. Anyway, Six Day War, incredible victory. The uh, six days happens to be how long the Bible says God created the earth. And people felt like God had re-intervened in history uh, to save the Jews. And, uh, and Israel was invincible and Jews were the coolest thing in the world now. And, um, and, and the, the idea of what it meant to be a Jew transformed profoundly, shockingly. I mean, you and I grew up with it, but um, uh, it, I'll give you two examples. Uh, that I always quote, which is the American Jewish Committee issued its annual report in 1966. It mentioned Israel on page 35. It didn't get to Israel to page 35. Uh, Nathan Glazer, very important Jewish sociologist, published a book called American Judaism. I believe the date is 1960. There's no mention of Israel in the book at all. Wow. And then overnight, the, uh, the job of American Jewish organizations became to support Israel and to sacralize the Holocaust which is another way of supporting Israel. It's its own thing as well, but it definitely, it says, because this is what you and I were taught in human school, because of the Holocaust, we have to support Israel no matter what. I mean, I, when I was in high school, I, I don't appear in the book really until the very end, but when I was in high school, I went on something called presidential classroom where nerdy kids go and are taken to places in Washington. Shocked and I remember, to hear that you were a nerdy kid and I yeah. Said, well, I, I I I was large and contained multitudes, but um, we went to a synagogue and and the rabbi and and some some kid from the Midwest who said something said I don't understand you Jews have a country why can't the Palestinians have a country, and I was turned to the kid I'm like how dare you, <laughs> what can you be thinking you know you can't imagine it's totally different, um, this is this is how we were taught, and 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 at the end of the book. Jumping ahead, um, like I said, I tell this book, I wrote this book as a historian so that really anyone, everyone will disagree with it, but I think anyone can learn from it. But at the end, I say, you know, there's a real problem here that there's, what does it mean to be an American Jew anymore if you don't like Israel and you think the Holocaust was terrible, but a long time ago, and there have been other terrible things that have happened. And uh, yeah, anti-Semitism is bad, but there's a lot of different kinds of persecution and racism. And to be honest, I don't really feel threatened by anti-Semitism. I don't like it. You know, it's annoying. Uh, and some people, I guess, suffer from it, but not very many so far anyway. Um, you know, Kanye West doesn't threaten me. He's a jerk. But, um, so, uh, and, and, I, and, and the Zionization of American Jewry that says, unless you support us, unless you support Israel, unless you believe in Israel, um, has lost Jewry uh, an awful lot of people, particularly young people, uh, consistently, the story, part of the story I'm telling is that American Jews have been asked to choose between their liberalism and their Zionism. Most of the time in the past, they've chosen their Zionism, but more and more they're choosing their liberalism. And, and so Israel is becoming a right-wing cause, and uh, the Palestinians have become a left-wing cause. Israel has become Goliath, and the Palestinians have become David. And and this is a new situation from the story I tell for most of the book. And and I and and you know, it struck me that your book came out, obviously not necessarily the plan, but it came out just after one of the most definitive elections in well, the I, I would argue the probably the most definitive election in Israel's history in terms of like it, it, this is a right wing country. I mean, it, Israel is now, I think, like by b both as a measure of what the electorate wants and how the government is constituted, this is a right wing country and there isn't as much of a sort of wiggle room as there has been in the past. Well, first of all, there isn't even a government yet. So let's let's see. Number one. Number two. Yes, it's a right wing country. There have been five elections in the past three years and they've all been dominated by the right. Now, the reason this 
country is so, this government is so right wing with crazy people running the ministries is a, is circumstantial. It has to do with the fact that the left couldn't get its shit together to have a joint list in order to, it lost a lot of votes because one of the two main left parties didn't qualify. If it had joined, if Labor and Merits had joined, they would have had almost double the representation they had. The Arab parties did not get together. If those two things had happened, the vote was almost pretty equal between the anti Netanyahu and the pro Netanyahu forces. But the turnout in the Knesset was very one sided. Kind of, I mean, it's messed up in similar ways to the way our own country is messed up in terms of representation for very different reasons. Um, but uh, but all five elections have shown roughly 70 percent support for the right uh, and maybe 25 percent for the center and maybe five percent or so for the left. Uh, Arabs, uh, sometimes they vote Palestinian Israeli, sometimes they vote, sometimes they don't because they don't feel like they get very much for their vote. So, uh, so yeah, we're we're approaching a crisis because of the oh the other important fact about this vote is that Bibi Netanyahu is afraid of going to jail. Right. Um, I wrote about it that in today's altercation. So he's giving away the store to these far right parties because they have promised to undermine Israel's judiciary in order that they can't get to him. So Israel is becoming more liberal, illiberal, more theocratic. And and, uh, and 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 more oppressive, in part because Bibi needs to stay out of jail than it otherwise would. If if it weren't for those things, if if he weren't demanding that the judiciary be undermined so that they could pass a law saying you can't send a prime minister to jail or even convict him of anything, then there would be an agreement with between Netanyahu and the left. But the left is saying no way, we're not giving you that. We hate you too much. So. There's there's an agreement with the right instead, and and this will, um, as you as you predict, you're saying it's already happening. It will happen. It hasn't happened yet. It will inspire a crisis both with American Jews and with the United States of America. I was at J Street last week, and uh, Tony Blinken came to speak, and he uh, pe most people were disappointed with his speech because he didn't lay out any clear markers about what Israel had better not do. But I thought that he he did. I thought that it was implicit that he was saying, we respect your democracy, we're your friend, but uh, we expect certain things of you, and if we don't get them, it'll be a new day. Well, I, I want to I want to circle back to this, because, I, I mean, uh, I, I, my, I guess my theory is, is that things break in a certain way when there is an underlying sort of like dynamic. And odds are that, you know, things break in a certain way when that underlying dynamic has shifted in a certain way, but the, uh, largely irrelevant for this conversation and, and in terms of your book. But so let's go back. So um, there has been a, a change. And I think we can see this change in the context of like, you know, folks like Tim Kaine refusing to go uh, when Bibi Netanyahu was invited by uh, John Boehner. Uh, during the Obama administration, like we can start to see the deterioration on the nominal center left uh, of support of Israel, and particularly amongst, you know, progressive Jews uh, of which or Democratic, you know, voting Jews, which is, you know, makes up like 75 percent of, of the Jewish population in this country. Um, increasingly, the support for Israel amongst Jews is um uh, concentrated in some very wealthy, and you write about uh, uh, Sheldon Adelson in the book, uh, uh, you know, very wealthy conservative Jews. Where, when did the shift become where Christian Zionism and the fundamentalist right, which I would argue is the most important component and definitional aspect of the right on some level, we could have an argument about that, but when did that when did that begin to sort of like shift the notion of American support of the the qualitative notion of American support of Israel? Well, my book covers a lot of many years, and there's a number of turning points that speak to this question. Um, I guess the first, like up until around 1980, 
Israel was always, the pro-Israel groups were always very good at getting support in Congress for what they wanted, but they did it quietly um, under, the, under the radar. Uh, they relied on like Jewish staffers and Jewish members and sometimes threats from funders. Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter were all driven crazy by them, but it was rarely on the front page. In 1980, uh, when Reagan became president and uh, put through a sale of weapons to Saudi Arabia, three groups came together. One was APAC, which after it lost its battle, decided it needed to become a, a massive grassroots organization. And it increased, uh, it increased its budget by like tenfold um, and, and set up offices all over the country and, and began doing uh, it had already begun some of this, but it began staffing congressional offices. It began policing the discourse, making sure that journalists didn't write anything that wasn't favorable about Israel, um, costing people their jobs, costing some congressmen and senators their jobs if they went the wrong way, just turning itself into the powerhouse. It became not unlike the National Rifle Association. Um, the second thing that happened is that the uh, Christian conservatives became politically active and defined Zionism as a fundamental precept of their uh, of their belief. The moral majority had Zionism as one of its original tenets. And it's fascinating. I have nobody who doesn't who follows this has any idea how strange the views of these Christian conservative leaders are when it comes to the role that Jews play in Armageddon. Oh and I I'm uh, I'm quite attuned to it. Two thirds uh, burn an eternal hellfire, which I have uh, am terrified of because of my eczema. And that is uh, <laughs> yeah, but like uh, this this Mr. Hagee fellow, if I'm not if I'm getting this right, who heads the largest pro-Israel organization in the world, Christians United for Israel, he says that Satan is the head of the European community, and everybody knows that. There's no point in arguing about it. Huh. Um, these people, this is something I've been writing about this just this week. The Jews made a, led by neoconservatives, and by the way, the third group is the neoconservatives who uh, came into being in the early 1980s, staffing uh, a few senators, but most importantly, getting uh, media gigs where they, they too, like AIPAC, enforced the pro-Israel discourse and, and, and attacked in quite personal terms anyone who deviated from it. Um, again, sometimes costing people their jobs. But uh, uh, what was I saying about Hagee? Well, you're saying Hagee's perspective on, um, on on essentially like, you know, what role Jews play in. Um... Oh, right. No, I was talking about uh, all of these leaders. Falwell, Pat Robertson, Hagee, they all say incredibly anti-Semitic things, leaving aside the theology where they're sending all us Jews to hell. They all, they all play well, two thirds. I think a third of us get to sit on the right hand side of God. I mean, I, but no, no, we have to, we have to convert in order to be saved. We're all going to hell. Yeah. Oh, um, the pits of hell. And, and, and Hagee, uh, he plans. said that he, he called Hitler a hunter sent by God to, to warn the Jews that they better get back to the land of Israel. Hitler is a hunter sent by God. That, that sounds like Kanye. Um, anyway, uh, so, so the Jews, I love this quote of Irving Kristol, although I disagree with it. He said, uh, what do we care what they, what their theology is, as long as they support Israel? He goes, so we don't get into the great country club in the sky. What we care about is Israel today. And all of the neocons and conservative organizations bought into this alliance with the Christian conservatives and, and formed the bloc. So, so now that's the basis of the Republican Party. It's the Jewish conservatives like Sheldon Adelson and there's some others. Paul Singer is another big funder on their behalf. Um, and, uh, and, the, and, and that's, you know, in Maggie Haberman's book, I don't, know, I don't know where her source is, but she says that Adelson made a straight deal with Trump, $20 million to move the embassy to, from Tel Aviv to, Israel, to Jerusalem. And Trump did it like, you know, cash up front. Um, so, so these funders, and, and if you followed the 22, 2022 election, where APAC for the first time made direct contributions to candidates instead of having a middleman, 
Um, they endorsed 109 insurrectionists. They even endorsed somebody who supported the replacement theory, which is quite explicitly anti-Semitic. Their original list, even though they had 109 Republican insurrectionists, did not have Lynn Cheney on it. Um, and, and then they went around the country to defeat progressive yep. Democrats, spending in one race $6.1 million uh, in, a, in a Democratic primary, which I made the difference in that one, in my opinion. You can't really know for sure. So uh, the Jewish organizations allied with the Israeli point of view have become, uh, have, have set themselves up in opposition to the majority of American Jews. And this is a new situation. As you say, the 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 view of progressive Jews has transformed over time so that today um, the Democratic Party is evenly split. The Republican Party is 100% in one category. Bibi Netanyahu could be president of the United States if he had been born here. Um, I mean, he could be Republican nominee anyway. I hope he wouldn't win. The Democrats are split about evenly now when they were also in Israel's camp throughout history. But young Democrats are actually much more sympathetic to the Palestinians. And so are young Jews, not quite as much as young non-Jews, but they are. So uh, the country, and in, in Israel, the young people are more right-wing than their parents and grandparents. So both American Jews and American young people are moving in the opposite direction from Israel's Jews and Israel's young people. And, and so the thing, the split you're seeing at the elite level is even stronger at the grassroots and, and, and will grow. Uh, that brings me, I guess, to to my last question. I mean, we're watching this sort of like divergence. Um, it has been my argument for at least a decade with, with 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 people that if you're actually concerned about the future of Israel, um, you want to empower the party in this country that is like willing or attempting to curb um israel's sort of like actions in the west bank to the extent that they they would or could what's what party would that be Sam? well i mean that i mean that's a good point i mean I, but i do think can i tell you a story on this point well, but, but I, I do think yes i i but but i do think the democratic party in 10 or 15 years is going to you know, despite the efforts of APAC, I mean, the reason why they have to do that is because they can see where this is going. Yeah, you're absolutely and, right. And I don't think ultimately they're going to be able to stop. They may be able to put it off for a certain period of time, but ultimately they're not going to be able to stop. And at one point there's going to be a democratic majority that is going to say, we're going to begin to condition our support for Israel, that yep. Israel is going to become analogous to and this may be 10 20 years off this is my theory and and, and it, i think good launching pad, pad for you to tell me why i'm wrong no no I'm, I'm actually but so I, impressed i've been I, writing I, about this for 40 years and I, you're absolutely right i do think that we're going to get to a point where the democratic party is going to um treat israel in many ways the way that the democratic party did south africa when no. you know, uh, when in the eighties, which is you like, go too far, my friend. You go too far. All right. Well, go ahead. Uh, it, but you were you were great up until that moment. <laughs> well, then uh, forget what I just last said. But 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 go ahead. Give us a sense of where this goes. Okay. Listen. So there's two stories that illustrate where this is going. The first one is Barack Obama wanted wanted. He said, "Look, Israelis have everything. Palestinians have nothing. Israelis need to make the first move, and it's going to be peace. I want a settlement freeze." So he sends his aide, his deputy national security, uh, a deputy national security council head, Ben Rhodes, to go see this liberal Democratic congressman to get his support. Ben Rhodes comes back all upset and harried, and Barack says, "What's the matter?" And he says, "Well, this guy really chewed me out." And and Obama says, "Why? I thought he was against settlement building." And Ben Rhodes says, "He is, but he's much more against." doing anything about settlement building. And I say that was the position of this Democratic congressman when Barack Obama became president, and it was the position of the Obama administration by the end of the uh, eight years, that that he he just couldn't keep banging his head against that wall. It, it, I mean, it, it, he, he would have had to do it full time and do nothing else, and he had other things to do. Now, roll ahead to um, 
last year, 2021, when you had uh, when you had the uh, the war between Israel and Gaza, I mean Israel and Hamas in Gaza, and uh, now Obama, who the Israelis hate, Israel is the only putatively democratic country in the world that prefers Trump to Obama or Biden, the opposite of American Jew. Um, and 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 this guy that the Israelis think is so terrible signed a memo of understanding that gives them $38 billion over a period of 10 years, which is American law. Nobody can mess with that. Nothing like that in the history of diplomacy that I've ever seen. Um, but Israel used a lot of the Iron Dome missiles, which are the missiles that shoot down other missiles, a system developed jointly by the Israelis and the United States during this war. And Congress put forth a bill to give Israel another billion so that they didn't have to spend any of that 38 billion on the Iron Dome missiles. There are 538 members of Congress. There were eight votes opposed, one abstention, AOC. Now, as I said, the Democratic Party is evenly split and young Democrats are more pro-Palestinian than not. And for the first time, thanks in part to social media and to we have talked about this, but a real transformation on the part of the mainstream media of how this issue is covered. You can get good information from both sides. Uh, yeah. So nothing is really hidden anymore. And yet it was worth eight votes or nine because AOC regretted not voting against it. So out of 538. Now that's the power of APAC and its allies. It's the power of our lack of democracy in our system. I mean, it's, it's no different from the NRA preventing gun control when 90% of Americans support tougher gun control. Now, Americans are still broadly supportive of Israel, but not in the way that U.S. policy reflects that. Israel is the only country in the world that doesn't have to account for how it spends its military aid. And it gets more military aid than any other country, probably more than most other countries combined. So that is going to be very slow and changing. That's, a, that's about the problems of our democracy. It's about where the power lies in the system. And it's about how little democracy is applied to foreign policy. I wrote a book about that a long, long time ago. Um, so uh, just to close up this question, it's, 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 it's the, this disjunction between the, the discourse that I'm writing about and the politics of the situation. I, I, was in, I gave a talk in Tel Aviv in May this year, and a guy raised his hand in the back and said, let's say I'm one of these pro-Trump Israelis, which I actually think he was. What do I care about what you're telling me about American Jews not liking us anymore um, and young people not like us anymore? What do I care? Because we have we have the Christian conservatives and we have the Republican Party and we have enough of everybody else. And I said, there's two reasons to care. One is if you lose American Jews, 80 percent of the world's Jews live in either the United States or Israel. If you lose American Jews, which which maybe not near says totally fine with him, um, you're really going to be alone in the world. Uh, do you really want to be alone in the world? I mean, I know you guys are already paranoid and act like you're alone in the world, but you're not. And you sort of know that. But if you are, it'll be a very different kind of life and, and a much harder one, I think. But second, and here's what we're talking about, the the Tony Blinkens of the world. I, I knew Tony pretty well when we were younger. I, I play poker with him. I still do, actually. He came to the poker game this year, which was really surprising. Uh, but um, those people are being educated in a very different way today than you and I were educated about this conflict. And those people, even if the politics are very slow to change, the people who, who work in the State Department, who work in the think tanks, who work in the National Security Council, who work in Congress, are going to have very different views about Israel. And that will be reflected in the kinds of policies that don't make the front page. And, um, and, and that's you're seeing some of that already. So that's what's going to change. And over time, as you say, 10 or 20 years, in my shop, it'll never be like South Africa. That's that's a completely different situation. That's one reason I think BDS is such a disaster because it's nothing like South Africa. But um, but the, but it, but Israel, particularly given how it has, how we began this talk, how quickly it's moving in the opposite direction, and how American Jews and the Democratic Party are moving in in a, in their own direction, there'll be more and more conflicts. You can see it. You know this the the uh, the killing of. Um, the Palestinian American journalist, where uh, Chris Van Hollen, a Democratic senator who from Maryland, 
is leading the charge to demand an investigation, and the FBI is saying we're going to we're going to go in because the Israelis are refusing to play ball. That would have been unthinkable not too long ago. So that's one symbol. I could point to others, but um, what what I find interesting, you know, I've written a lot of books about the various failures of American democracy. This is another one, just like you see uh, with guns. And uh, people get mad at me when I compare APAC to um, the NRA, but really, it's it's about power, and it's it's just like the NRA doesn't represent the views of most uh, law-abiding gun people who have guns. The APAC does not represent the views of American Jews remotely. Well, Eric Alterman, professor of English and journalism at Brooklyn College, author of his latest, We Are Not One, A History of America's Fight Over Israel, and of course, the writer who gives us altercation now at the American Prospect. Um, always a pleasure to talk to you. This is a, um, it's a fascinating history and, um, I, I don't know who better suited to, to have, uh, written it, frankly. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it, Sam. I really <laughs> We are back and we are joined now by Javier Puente, professor of Latin American and Latino studies at Smith College, joining us from Peru. Um, Javier, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Thank you so much. I mean, it's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I, it, it's uh, I'm so glad that you're you're able to come on because you can provide some context uh, for us who are just, you know, I'm reading the New York Times piece on what's mm -hmm. happening there and I know I'm not getting really the full story. So um, if you could just give our audience a bit of a rundown of what has happened in Peru over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and there are some recent developments that I would like to um, probably also mention. But let's start by saying that on December 7th, um, basically a week ago, um, President uh, Pedro Castillo uh, attempted a coup uh, in Peru. Um, he illegally tried to dissolve the Congress, um, to intervene in the judiciary system and impose a state of emergency. And um, in practice, he was going to become uh, a dictator, an authoritarian leader, which is something that for a long while, many of the media and the people who oppose him claimed that he, would, he was trying to become. And, you know, so many sectors in the left always defended him, and it was sort of tragic to see that development. Um, he was not backed by the military, which is something that every single leader who attempts to do a coup has to have uh, some sort of military backup. He was not backed up. His ministers resigned within minutes after this declaration, um, and um, feeling unsupported, uh, he rushed to the Mexican embassy. Uh, he was trapped in traffic. Uh, he was um, almost within the hour impeached by the Congress uh, in a constitutional measure. And once impeached and uninvested from his power, he was captured by the police, put under custody, and is, as of we speak, waiting for a preliminary conviction for 18 months while well, there is an investigation that can put him in jail for the next 10 days. Now, um, his... Um, Disenfranchisement from power has uh, placed his vice, pres vice president, Dina Boluarte, the first um, female president of Peru, in power. Um, she is meant constitutionally to finish the mandate until 2026. And this seeming alliance between the Congress who impeached Castillo, who doesn't have legitimacy among Peru's 
populations, electoral populations, and Boluarte has ignited a series of protests nearly everywhere except in Lima, or except at least in like some, some parts of Lima. But um, the provinces and departments and regions who voted majority Charlie for Castillo are currently in a state of emergency with massive protests on the streets, with uh, casualties that are counted in, uh, I think, do a dozen or almost close to a dozen by now, uh, with great degrees of state repression and basically with one single message. The people are claiming that Boluarte anticipates elections and we hold elections sooner than later to replace both her as president, but also the Congress, to adjourn the Congress, which does not, which that does not have the legitimacy to continue ruling Peru. So the, the protests that you describe, I know that uh, Castillo had a coalition that included, uh, in terms of support for him, um, the indigenous people as uh, well as labor unions. Um, now, you know, we're a show on the left, right? Like, we're supportive of those groups as well. But his, you're essentially saying that his attempts to dissolve Congress were authoritarian and uh, unconstitutional as well. So where, where does the anger lie? Because he, he, he did try to do something illegal, it seems, mm -hmm. but the... Uh, I, w I can completely sympathize with the frustration from the coalitions that voted him in, especially because he himself, you know, he made, uh, I believe he was a teacher at one point and a union activist as well. These are the kinds of coalitions in theory you would want to be building. Um, and yet mm -hmm. th here we are. Yes, that's a great question, Emma. Something that I've been trying to um, discuss openly since a piece I published back in 2021 on NACLA, uh, Report of the Americas, has been um, questioning the leftist credentials that Castillo has, right? Um, yes, he's a union leader or was a union leader at some point. He's a rural teacher. Um, he claims or does have campesino origins, but that didn't really transform him necessarily into a leftist per se. Um, and so let's say that. Now, a number of groups that are often represented by the left voted for Castillo. I think not so much because of his leftist credentials, but because how anti-system and anti-establishment his candidacy seem to them. Right? So there is an enduring claim for a major transformation and a major overhaul that distances itself from any options of the traditional political spectrum, so to speak. And in that sense, I think Castillo's um, possibility as a president really captivated this popular claim, right? But it's a popular claim that exceeded Castillo. And of course, the moment Castillo tried to become an authoritarian leader, that, that claim is out there and it lacks representation and it lacks leadership. Mm. And it says a lot about the lack of institutional politics that there is no single party or political leadership that is able to seize that theme from the streets and transform it into an institutionalized demand for change. Um, that said, it's interesting how Castillo's imprisonment is becoming a hemispheric issue. I don't know if you or your followers have, um, have been paying attention to what's happening over the last few days, but um, the presidents of Argentina, Colombia, uh, Bolivia and Mexico have issued a statement reprimanding the imprisonment, uh, accompanying the, the, the imprisonment of Castillo. And um, to their surprise, President Boric from Chile did not sign that statement. So there is now this hemispheric question about was Castillo leftist? Is he a leftist? Can we see this as yet another oligarchic strike back against the left in Peru? I think there is some truth to that form of seeing this issue, but it's it's slightly more complex than that. Gotcha. So then can you do you also mind shedding light on the context about how uh, Castillo, there were numerous attempts at impeaching him prior to this by the Congress, which leans further right, is my understanding. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so um, I, I think there has been an enduring 
crisis that is stemming from the Congress since at least 2018, when a Congress controlled by Keiko Fujimori's party, Keiko Fujimori is the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, a former dictator of Peru, currently in prison due to human rights atrocities and abuses committed in between 1992 and 2000, when he ruled um, Peru with an authoritarian um, uh, with an authoritarian hand, uh, and Keiko has been trying to run for president since at least 2006. Um, and um, while she has failed at every single attempt to become president, her party was always able to put an important number of people in Congress and often holding majority. So since 2018, there has been a very explicit, very tangible congressional agenda led by Fujimorismo, led by Keiko Fujimori, to destabilize Peruvian democracy. Why? Because she resents that she didn't win the presidency. Mm. There has been a number of rightist powers that have collided with um, um, Fujimorismo and have grouped together to enhance and strengthen that destabilizing agenda. So the attempts of impeachment against Castillo precede Castillo and, in my opinion, will continue beyond Castillo and beyond Boluarte. Because the agenda of these powers that are that are pro-capital, pro-business, pro everything that we consider aligned with the right is to maintain this permanent sense of political instability for the benefit of capital, for the benefit of the perpetuation of extractivism, for the benefit of everything that is related to the way a neoliberal economy has seized control of the political structure of a country. So with all of that context of how aggressive the right has been in Peru, is it in, in some way uh, Castillo's response to this uh, kind of a, a way to undercut those efforts? And essentially he was being set up with a, a nearly impossible situation politically. So is it is it too far to say that he was attempting to become a dictator in that way? Did he go to I mean, I know you said he you feel he went too far, but I, I from the outside, it just seems that there were efforts to undercut him from an extremist right from the get go. And that was this response, which might have been too much, but but understandable nonetheless. Uh, I think to some degree, so something that um, has been suggested is comparing this measure that Castillo tried to do with something that President Vizcarra a few years ago also did, with, which was constitutionally adjourning the Congress. So um, there is a constitutional arrangement by which if the Congress denies trust to two sets of ministers, two cabinets, um, to the executive power, then the executive power, meaning the presidency, can claim that this Congress has become an obstacle for continuing rule, for continuing the administration, and is constitutionally empowered to adjourn the Congress. Right. So what Castillo tried to do in form resembled that. Nevertheless, he did not have the grounds, and therefore he, he in in fact, I think, um, broke the constitution, broke constitutional order. Now, um, I think it will be giving Kim too much credit to say that for as leader or as short as his presidency was, he ruled with a leftist agenda. There was no clear sign throughout the entire presidency that he was in fact a leftist, right? And I'll give you, Emma, I'll just give you a token. Um, People who voted for him as a leftist option are, for instance, pro de escalating extractivist economies, extractivist activities in Peru's countryside, in Peru's highlands, particularly mining. And nearly every single measure undertaken by Castillo was pro mining, pro extractivism, pro the continuation of the economic model. Mm. And that, I think, describes a sense of, uh, of, of loss, of Castillo never understood who he was ruling for and who his allies were. Because he did not have a party, because he did not have allies, because he barely had really a representation in Congress. He sought for multiple forms of ruling. And, you know, standing in the middle for too long 
was crushed from every single power around him. The left, the legal left, the, the sort of like social democratic left, promptly broke links with Castillo because there was no pursuit of a leftist agenda. And then he just fell victim of, yes, there was an ongoing attack from the right against his presidency. And, and how, that, how legitimate were those impeachment claims then made by the right? We'll never know. We'll never know because he, I, I think there were investigations being conducted that offer some grounds because media here, here in Peru is monopolized and is controlled by one single corporation, the Grupo El Comercio, controls 85% of all media in Peru. And this media is aligned with these same powers. Every single investigation became a political pursuit, a, polit a political hunt. And there was no sense of due process ever delivered in every single investigation. I think it's fair to say that there were grounds for continuing independent investigations, and these investigations were warranted not just against Castillo, but, but against every single president. So that said, that said, I don't think any of these measures, neither the alleged political prosecution that he was confronting by these rightist powers, nor these impeachment attempts you really justify what he tried to do on December 7th. And I think at that point, he betrayed the last remnants of leftist alliances that he had behind him. So then the motivations for the demonstrations, which are now people are cracking down, or well, uh, Bolate um, cracking down on it as the, the new president. Um, there's been a, a state of emergency declared. Mm -hmm. And as you say, at least a dozen people have died in these protests. What is the motivation behind the... Pr I mean, you, you talked about it a bit, but w if with Bolarte taking power, it, it seems like they're upset that she'll be in power and they didn't really vote for her until 2026. But um, is there m that much ideological difference between the two? What is driving this... Th these mass protests to get her out specifically? I think it's, it's been interesting to see Boluarte's very abrupt change of discourse. When she was inaugurated as the first female president of the country, she said, I am here to stay until 2026, which in practice meant that the Congress would also stay until 2026. And I think that, com and, and then, you know, the other piece of the uh, discourse was she asked for a truce. She asked for, um, you know, I'm a, a sort of like a stalemate uh, of aggression between the Congress and the executive branch so that some governance could be pursued. Um, within days, now we're seeing a Boluarte that just today said, yes, it is her priority to move elections from 2026 to 2024, which could be the earliest that Peru could hold elections again. And the other piece of the message is we all go home. And by all go home is I go home, Castillo went, well, Castillo went to prison, I'll go home, the Congress also goes home. And right now, Congress is sessioning and is debating this possibility of advancing the elections for 2024. That, in principle, should be a decompressing measure for solving some aspect of the crisis. There are another deeper aspects that are igniting this crisis that require a substantial political reform that I think is far more ambitious. I, I, I don't see any leadership that has the legitimacy or the power or the support to actually pursue that major institutional overhaul that proven democracy requires. The last interesting piece I will mention about this is to see how regional governments, uh, Peru is a unitarian country, but we have regional governors and the cluster of regional governors recently issued a statement proposing an agenda to not just decompress the protests, but also to move forward in order to gain more governance. And that's interesting because I think right now all the responses are resting on what Lima will do and what power will Lima can do. Whereas in fact, we can look into the provinces, into the regions, into other departments of Peru to seek for the answers that we need to solve this crisis long-term. Lastly, um, the conservative who uh, Castillo defeated in the election, uh, Fujimori, who I, I believe you, you referenced earlier, um, very scary figure. Uh, it, I, my initial reading of her is that she was supportive of 
forced sterilization for indigenous people in Peru, among a bunch of other... Although all you really need to hear is that statement, then you go, okay, I have a good sense of how horrible this this woman is. Um, mm -hmm. What is her? What are her political prospects now with the ousting of Castillo or someone like her on the right if mm -hmm. these elections do happen in twenty twenty four? It's really hard to say, um, Emma. Um, Keiko Fujimori has been subject to a major investigation uh, on the grounds of corruption and uh, particularly the way the um, 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 special research group that uh, conducted an investigation on her and her party um, uh, phrase it. Um, Keiko Fujimori is the leader of a criminal organization devoted to money laundering that is masked under the cover of a political party. So this political party that she leads, it's a criminal organization. She has been put in prison preemptively a couple of times. She was released due to COVID and the, in the beginning of the pandemic. She's still subject to this investigation. And in any other country, being subject to such an investigation would make you completely out, would put you completely out of any political run. In Peru, you don't know, right? And we don't know. What we do know is that in the meantime, as Keiko Fujimori's leadership has deteriorated due to this investigation to some degree, other right-wing leaders have emerged that are, you know, have far more atrocious discourses than Keiko Fujimori does. If you consider that atrocious, you know, the next mayor of Lima, um, he is a sort of like a mini Jair Bolsonaro kind of uh, fascist-like leader. And so, you know, the right will produce an alternative that will guarantee the perpetuation of the economic model, first and foremost, and these same political groups that have held control of a crook political party system for the last 20 years, no doubt. The, uh, the question is, who can oppose them? Who can lead the opposition? Who can lead those anti-establishment feelings combined with anti-Fujimorista feelings into a feasible, comprehensive political option for 2024 or 2026? We don't know. We'll see. All right. Well, actual last last question. Um, is constitutional reform in Peru, what, what is the status of that with these, up, uh, these updates, these new developments? Is it defeated? Is it stalled? Where Where is I, that at? So one of the points in the agenda of Castillo was promoting a constitutional assembly that would replace the 1993 constitution, that is the one currently in place in Peru. That was a constitution sponsor written by Alberto Fujimori uh, that uh, favored and framed his authoritarian rise. And therefore, yes, I, I think it should be replaced. I don't think constitutional reform is the way to go for Peru, right? So a lot of the people who defended this option look at Chile as an example. The constitutional moment in Chile, it's something that has been building up for at least 30 years. Mm. And, you know, when you see the coalition of social and political forces that came to be represented in the Constitutional Assembly, you can see how those that grassroots activi activism and built up actually finally express itself into this constitutional moment. If we elect a Constitutional Assembly right now, Emma, there is no guarantee that political forces different to the ones right now in Congress will write an even more conservative constitution as a result of that constitutional transformation. So I don't think that is the way to go, but right now everything is, is like uh, on hold until we, we solve this crisis. Javier Puente, uh, professor of Latin American and Latino studies at Smith College. Thank you so much uh, for, for coming on, calling us from Peru. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Emma. Thank you. All right. With that, we are going to head into the fun half. Uh, it's almost like Sam is here, right? Very delayed uh, in, in our fun half. And we have an in-studio guest. Um, not right now, but you want to come over? Just, just, just peek in. Look at him. Hey. Everyone recognize this fella? Brandon Sutton in the flesh. You know what it is. <laughs> All right. Well, you're going to be sitting over there. Um, we'll be doing uh, the uh, we'll have Binder uh, on the phones and uh, Brandon Sutton in the flesh. As we, uh, So, uh, Matt, first, though, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Oh, yeah. Uh, Left Reckoning. Gosh, uh, put me on the spot there. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, why am I blanking on what we're doing? Left? Oh, Mike Christine, we talked about comedy, um, and uh, I got into uh, some Tybee stuff. Uh, Patreon.com says Left Reckoning. I also talk about JFK stuff in the post game. Uh, um, so looking forward to that. And uh, this weekend for patrons. Oh, actually, the thing that I really need to uh, promote is the live show. Woo! Which I keep forgetting to do on this show, but uh, uh, there's going to be another Give Them a R Revolution Reckoning uh, yeah. live show in New York this time. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, put the details there at the Cutting Room on January 22nd, uh, including me and David Griscom, as well as uh, Bhaskar Sankara, Jason Miles, Ben Burgess, and uh, Sam Cedar and Emma Vigland. So uh, it's going to be a fun show. Uh, that's January 22nd at the Cutting Room. Uh, I've retweeted that. We'll put uh, tickets, uh, a link to the tickets in the uh, description. Uh, and on ESVN today, Bradley and I, given our picks, I might want to, at some point, maybe not today, but I want to do a deep dive into this Fenway sports group and their acquisition of teams like Liverpool, the Red Sox, and uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins and what that means for sports. Cause While hemorrhaging all of their good players. <laughs> hemor so, because they're refusing to spend money. They're... The, the once proud Boston Red Sox have now let two homegrown prospects, uh, stars, leave their team in Mookie Betts and, and Xander Bogarts. Um, and I, that has directly to do with the cheapness of this ownership group. Um, and I just think that it's a troubling development in sports. But that's not today. Hey, <laughs> today. They won the World Series. They broke the, they broke the curse. And what more do you want from them? It's time to save some money. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But so, but I will do, but not today, because I want to do more research on that before I speak on it. However, today, Bradley and I will uh, be giving our picks against the spread for this week in the NFL. We are still, there's a two-game differential between us. It's getting hot. We're doing it through the playoffs as well. Um, YouTube.com slash ESVN show. All right. That's at 4 p.m., I should say. Uh, we are not taking calls today. We do not have enough time. Sorry, but you can IM. Um, because also, if you're mad about sound about the first interview, uh, email. Yeah, I am not. Res we are not responsible for it. You can email and uh, the complain there. At yeah. <laughs> Please email the show. Sam reads that email. And he, will, he will read the feedback and comment on it. When it there back. you go. Exactly. Um, all right. See you in the fun house. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty.